Antennas are structures designed to efficiently emit and receive electromagnetic waves, which in turn can be used to wirelessly transfer information between devices. However, they are also used in a wide range of applications including radar, meteorology, radio astronomy, geolocation, and surface reconstruction. In simple terms, if we analyze an antenna acting as a transmitter, a certain amount of electric charge will move through it, generating an electromagnetic field that will expand in multiple directions, while on the other hand, an antenna acting as a receiver will be affected by that electromagnetic field, generating an alternating current. This will have a frequency similar to that of the electromagnetic field and, therefore, to the current that was initially in the transmitting antenna, allowing the transfer of information. But there is much more to it than that, so in this video we will see how an antenna works, what are its physical principles, its main characteristics and the different types that exist. To understand how an antenna works, we must first understand at least two physical principles and some other concepts. The first of these is Ampere's law, which tells us that when an electric charge moves through a conductor, that is, an electric current, it generates a magnetic field which can also be represented as a magnetic flux, lines that form a closed circuit and have a specific direction. Which by the way can be determined using the right hand rule with the thumb pointing in the direction of the current and the rest of the fingers indicating the direction of the magnetic flux. The second physical principle is the Faraday lens law which tells us that when a conductor is in the presence of a magnetic flux, if the flux varies in time, an electromotive force or voltage will be generated by the conductor, whose direction will assume the magnetic field that generated it. Having understood this, now let's see an example of how these principles are applied in the operation of a pair of antennas composed of a simple straight wire, one of the antennas being the transmitter and the other the receiver. By feeding the transmitting antenna with direct current due to Ampere's law will generate a cylindrical magnetic field, which will initially grow but then stabilize. If we repeat this process, but with the receiving antenna at a shorter distance when the magnetic field is growing, a voltage will be generated in it, disappearing again once the magnetic field stabilizes. This behavior is interesting, but not very useful, because basically we would be sending a single signal and nothing else. However, the result is totally different if we switch from direct current to alternating current or in other words, if we continuously change the direction of the current passing through the transmitting antenna. In this configuration, although the magnetic field will continue to expand in the shape of a cylinder, when we look at the magnetic flux lines, we will notice that its direction will reverse at the same frequency as the polarity change current. Because of this, the receiving antenna will find itself always being affected by a varying magnetic flux and therefore this time the voltage will not disappear after a while. Although, on the other hand, its sign will vary continuously at the same frequency as the direction of the magnetic flux varies. That is, the receiving antenna will be generating an alternating current. This way, if we analyze a piece of conductor in space, the variable magnetic field will generate a current by which the electric charges will accumulate at each end alternately, generating a potential difference between them with its corresponding electric field. Because of this, when we have a variable magnetic field, we speak of electromagnetic fields. Moreover, since the magnetic field can be described by magnetic flux lines with a certain direction and the electric field can be described by a vector in the direction of the potential difference, we could analyze how they change through time at a point in space with which we would obtain two vectors that oscillate continuously perpendicular to each other. We could even go a step further and chart the path followed by the tip of both vectors. By doing this, two perpendicular sinusoidal waves would be generated which together are known as electromagnetic waves, and, like all waves, they will be described mainly by three related parameters. First, their frequency, which as already mentioned, depends mainly on the frequency of the current that generated the magnetic field in the emitting antenna. Second, its propagation speed, which for the particular case of electromagnetic waves moving in a vacuum, is equal to the speed of light, that is approximately 300,000 km per second, which by the way is a bit redundant, because light is an electromagnetic wave. And third, the wavelength, which indicates the distance traveled by the wave when it makes a complete oscillation. At this point, 
Although it seems that we are moving away from the main topic, which is antennas, the truth is that understanding these concepts is extremely relevant, because the characteristics of these waves are directly related to how they are designed, being especially relevant in the receiving antennas because their size can be varied in relation to a certain wavelength to optimize their efficiency in certain frequency ranges of the electromagnetic spectrum. It should be noted that, similar to the initial example, where both the transmitting and receiving parts were structurally the same, all antennas are capable of fulfilling these two functions. However, this does not mean that using two similar antennas is the best option because, as we will see below, they have a series of characteristics that make them more or less appropriate for each application. For example, if we wanted an antenna capable of emitting and receiving signals in all directions, we could use a monopole antenna which are the typical antennas that are mainly composed of a metal cylinder, or a dipole antenna as well, which is composed of two conductors positioned symmetrically forming a straight line. In these cases, when used as emitters, the radiated electromagnetic field would have a shape similar to a donut or, more technically, a toroid. This visualization would give us a quick understanding of where would be the best place to put a receiving antenna, which would be in the outermost band or away from the antenna. Although it should be noted that when looking for the characteristics of an antenna it is more common to find the same information in the form of two radiation patterns made in terms of its angular variables, the elevation angle and the azimuth angle. These relate to what is known as polar coordinates, a way of describing vectors in three-dimensional space using three parameters, something particularly useful for describing shapes that expand from a central point such as antennas. The first parameter is a distance r from the center point. The second parameter is the elevation which refers to the angle between a vertical axis and the vector, and the third parameter is the azimuth which refers to the angle between a projection of the vector in the horizontal plane and a horizontal axis. So, the radiation pattern related to the elevation angle is what we would see when intercepting the edges of the toroid with a vertical plane passing through the center, while the radiation pattern related to the azimuth angle is what we would see when intercepting the edges of the toroid with a horizontal plane passing through the center. Although I mentioned that this pattern corresponds to the electromagnetic field generated by the antenna, we have not yet discussed what exactly the perimeter of these patterns represents. Of course, we know that the farther away from the center, the greater the signal strength emitted by the antenna in that direction, but we have not given a scale and therefore we would not have a point of comparison for antennas with the same radiation pattern. The unit used for this type of pattern is gain, which is measured in decibels or decibels relative to an isotropic pattern. This part can be a bit confusing, but let's hang on a minute. The isotropic decibel is a dimensionless unit that is calculated as the division between the power density of the antenna at a certain distance and direction, and the power density that would have been obtained by using an isotropic radiator, with both antennas radiating at the same total power. In this case, an isotropic radiator is simply a theoretical reference antenna that emits electromagnetic waves with equal intensity in all possible directions. Thus, if we visualize the power density of both antennas when the power of our analyzed antenna is higher than the density of the isotropic antenna, we will have positive isotropic decibels, and when it is lower, we will have negative isotropic decibels. One of the reasons why the characteristics of an antenna are represented in this way is that the information presented will remain true, even when the power with which the antenna is fed has varied. If the graph were made based on a specific power, it would be valid for that single power, which would not be very useful and could generate confusion. At this point we have already talked enough about antennas from the physical point of view. So now we will focus on their functionality by analyzing some of the most common types of antennas that exist. Monopole and dipole antennas, as previously mentioned, have an omnidirectional radiation pattern. Because of this, they are used as transmitters when you want to transmit a signal to many receivers or when the position of the receiver is unknown and therefore you want to cover as much space as possible. On the other hand, they are also useful when the position of the transmitting antenna is unknown. Their main advantages are their easy construction and low cost. They are used in very simple devices that do not require a very high gain, 
such as TV antennas, radio antennas, old cell phones, car antennas, modems, routers, walkie-talkies, etc. Despite not being so popular anymore, you may have seen Yagi Yuda antennas at some point. They are composed of an array of dipole antennas placed parallel to each other in a horizontal plane. All of these dipole antennas are usually the same length except for one or more at the rear which are slightly longer and known as reflectors. In this antenna, a single dipole is fed with current, the one closest to the reflectors, while the rest of them amplify and direct the radiation, which means that this time we have a directional antenna whose radiation pattern would be something like this. Continuing with the directional antennas, we have horn antennas as well, which work similar to a megaphone. Inside it we will find a monopole or dipole antenna like the ones we saw before, but what makes them different is the integration of a waveguide which provides directivity to the radiation giving also a high gain to the antenna. In addition, horn antennas have the advantage of emitting radiation over a wide frequency range. In other words, they have a wide bandwidth. Because of this they are often used in applications such as radar for speed control, and door and gate operators. Another type of directional antenna is the patch antenna, which basically consists of a rectangular conductor through which a current flows. In general, this conductor is a square plate with a length of half wavelength of the signal with which it is fed, being directional antennas with a relatively large radiation width given its physical structure. Its great advantage is the ease of implementation in printed circuits at a low cost, often used in cell phones and laptops. Finally, we also have parabolic antennas. These are composed of a parabola-shaped surface which is known as a dish and a waveguide, usually a horn antenna which is positioned at the focus of the parabola and is directed directly to the surface. When used as a transmitter, the waveguide releases a signal that bounces off the dish and is transmitted into space, while when used as a receiver the signal first bounces off the dish and then enters the waveguide. Due to the geometrical properties of a parabola the signal exits in a straight line parallel to the dish with a very high directivity. Currently, this is the antenna with the highest gain and the lowest radiation width, concentrating the radiation in a very small angle and being used for very high frequencies where other antennas would be inefficient. These have diverse applications such as telephony, wireless internet radio transmission and reception, satellite communication and radio telescopes, among many others. Finally, although each of the antennas we have seen have certain characteristics that make them useful for different situations, it is also important to mention their limitations. Regarding their efficiency, the input power as electric current will always be greater than the output power as electromagnetic waves because, just like the entire electrical system, it will present energy losses as it is built with materials that dissipate part of the power in the form of heat. Another limitation that we can find if we focus on their functionality is that all the radiation patterns we saw were made considering that electromagnetic waves would propagate in a free space, that is, without obstacles that could absorb, reflect or deflect the signals. Unfortunately, this assumption is far from reality, where there are all kinds of objects that can affect signal propagation. In fact, in high-frequency 5G networks operating between 25 and 39 GHz, this effect is so strong that even a simple tree standing between two antennas within 100 meters of each other could attenuate the signal and prevent communication between them. I hope you liked this video. Remember to subscribe, and if you think what I do is worthwhile you can also support me on Patreon to make more and better videos. That's all for now and see you in the next video.